Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Calvin Winner, Head of Collections at the Sainsbury Centre for Visual Arts. And um, I've called my presentation uh, uh, Rediscovering Frink, but um, I think it's worth saying um, initially um, how, um, how, I, how I discovered um, her work. And the first time I came across it was, um, I think, at about 1984, possibly 85, in um, St. Margaret's Church in Kings Lynn. And um, I was um, um, a child, and I was probably dragged along um, reluctantly um, to see an exhibition. And um, for some reason, for some reason that I'll, I'll try and explain, um, her work, and um, it was a group of bronzes, and the, and the famous goggleheads in particular um, stuck, stuck in my mind. Um, for some reason, um, it, it, it did stick, and it gelled. And... Um, in a sense, it's, it was a very formative experience, and I'm not sure when I next came across her work, or indeed when I next thought about it, but it stuck very, very early on. And um, um, much more recently, in the last few years, when I had the chance to um, 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 curate an exhibition myself, um, it really made me think about that, that, that initial um, discovery, and in a way, why it had taken me so long to come back to her work. And, um, I'll try and talk a little bit about that um, now because I think um, with any artist there's, um, there's always periods of their, of their career and their life and their afterlife when there's more attention um, placed on their work um, and um, I think there was a period um, when um, Liz Frink's work was perhaps overlooked and rather forgotten and um, I was thinking about um, the major survey exhibitions of, of sculpture, the sort of state um, run exhibitions which um, the Tate or the Royal Academy um, hosts and um, there have been a number I think in about 2013, 2014 um, there was a survey of uh, 20th century British sculpture at the RA and um, it, um, it became quite controversial because a number of artists work um, wasn't included and, and Liz's work was one of them which was excluded um, around the same time there was a um, an exhibition again at the, at the RA on bronze. And um, um, again, her work was excluded. And um, it was beginning to look like a bit of a pattern. Um, and in my more recent research, um, I started to think, well, OK, so in these recent, recent exhibitions, fairly recent exhibitions, she wasn't included. How far do you have to go back? And um, again, there was a large survey exhibition at the Whitechapel Art Gallery in about 1981. And... Um, and Liz was included in the catalogue, but, but not in the exhibition. She's essentially a footnote by 1981. You have to go back to 1965 at the Tate Gallery, an exhibition on contemporary British sculpture, and you find um, a reasonable selection of her, of her work. And I've actually, um, funnily, I've got a, a copy of the little pamphlet that was produced at the time. And um, so 1965, you really get a sense of... of how things are changing. And um, this exhibition, I won't go through and list all the artists included, but clearly you can begin to see um, the battle that's going on between figuration and abstraction. And actually, it's, it's, it's heading, to, heading towards um, the abstraction artists. And Anthony Caro and the New Generation sculptors, who many of you will be familiar with, are beginning to take um, centre stage. And I was surprised to see so many figurative artists um, included. So, um, so you really get, need to go back to 1965. And um, if the big state institutions are not supporting an artist's work, if they're not showing them, then clearly an artist is at risk of slipping off the, um, off the agenda. Now, let me see if I can go on to the next slide. Over the last two to three years, um, I've been thinking a lot about Liz Frink and um, putting together a major show. And um, the, um, the exhibition that we will, um, we will host um, is in the autumn of this year, and it's going to be quite a large exhibition. I would say probably the largest that's happened since the posthumous show in 94 at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. So um, it's... Um, this, actually, I should, I should say this, um, this photograph... Um, is probably from about 54, I think, 1954. And um, so Liz is in the studio with this remarkable cat sculpture, which um, I've been thinking a lot about um, in recent months. Absolutely wonderful. 
um, work that will be in our exhibition. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so just to give a slight overview um, um, and pick up on some threads um, that Kip and um, we heard from Annette's notes. Um, the, um, I won't read all this out. Um, um, you can scan, scan through it. What I would focus on, actually, is that having said that these recent large survey shows um, um, really didn't do justice to Liz at all, but um, there has been a growing number of exhibitions um, outside of the capital, mostly, um, that have focused on her work, and I've listed a few here if you, if you, if you go down towards the end of the, um, the text. So, um, so 2013 at the light box, um, the Genogli Gallery in 2015, which focused on her public commissions, and then um, more recent than that, um, Hauser and Worth, um, Somerset in 2016, um, and um, the show here in Cambridge um, um, in 2017 and just into 2018. So, um, so having said that for many, many years, I think there was a sense that perhaps Frink was being lost, lost to us. Um, clearly a growing number of curators and institutions were interested in her work, and from talking to people involved in all of these exhibitions, um, what is clear is that her work remains very, very popular, and um, there's a real hunger to see her work. Now, I've included this slide because um, in thinking about um, um, the works I'd like to include um, in the exhibition later this year, um, this is a work that um, I was obviously aware of. I, I actually, actually hadn't seen it um, um, in its outdoor setting, but I saw it here in Cambridge when I came to the opening, and I was completely taken by it. Um, it's an absolutely remarkable piece. And having thought, I you know, it, it's, it was kind of on the long list, but I hadn't really focused up on it properly. And um, I guess what I, what I like in, in particular, it's, I mean, it has such wonderful grace to it, but actually the movement in it is just remarkable. And how an artist is able to generate that much energy and movement um, in bronze is just just incredible. So, um, so thank you to um, uh, Pirona and um, the exhibition makers here for um, pointing this out to me and making me aware of it. It will now feature, I suspect, quite prominently in the exhibition that I'm making. So, um, so some of the aims of the exhibition that I'm going to be working on, um, I genuinely believe that, that Frink is one of the most important artists British artists of the second half of the 20th century. And um, I think, um, you know, it, it's 25 years this year since she died, and I think it is very timely to put on um, um, a, a major exhibition of her work. So it's timely, and um, I hope, uh, my, my intention is that actually um, there's a lot of people who know her work and, and are engaged um, in it, but... Um, but I genuinely want to introduce it to um, a new and younger audience, um, like here. Ho ho hopefully, um, um, many students have come to see the exhibition here, and obviously the Sainsbury Centre is also um, um, a university art gallery, so um, um, the idea is to actually introduce her work to, to a younger um, uh, generation. Um, I, think, um, I think that's probably enough on the aims of the exhibition um, I mean, I won't really pick up too much on, on some of the battles which I've, I've mentioned already between abstraction and figuration. I think um, what we all now realise is that actually that's, that particular moment um, that Frink um, lived through, of um, particularly from abstraction, the dogma of, of, of abstraction, and actually how um, people who wanted to work in a figurative way were really, really sort of ostracised. I think that moment is clearly clearly gone. We don't need to worry about that too much now. Um, so, um, so the sort of politics of, of, of that situation um, may be picked up in, in, in essays in the catalogue, but um, it will really be a celebration of her work and, and, and the major themes in her work. Um, I include this slide because I particularly like, like it. Um, it's um, it's, um, again, from the mid-1950s. I think it's the year before her first solo exhibition at St. George's Gallery in London. In the 1950s, that her reputation grows incredibly quickly, um, and she's, um, she's very, very young. And um, looking at reviews of exhibitions um, 
both in Britain and she also had exhibitions in, in continental Europe in that period, um, you realise that actually um, her standing then was, was incredibly high. And I want to try and recapture some of that spirit um, of the early years. Um, the exhibition will, will go over the entire, um, um, her entire life, but um, I really want to sort of recapture some of that early enthusiasm and energy for her, for her work. So um, beginning to sort of think about um, the themes that I want to cover in the exhibition, and um, for me, the starting point was, was the goggle heads and the, um, and the tribute heads and the way that these examine um, human behavior and particularly the sort of the polar opposites of, of the aggressor and the victim. And I think the exhibition will still focus heavily on that, that group of works, which, um, as I recalled, was my first encounter with, um, with Frink. Um, the early period and those incredible um, 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 predatory bird bird pieces, which are just, just remarkable and incredibly um, um, well thought out and expressive. Um, a really good um, representation of those and the protean heads that she made in, in the later 1950s. We mustn't forget about the, um, the wonderful cat. Um, the later 50s, um, well, I, should, I, should, I should just say that the, the, these early predatory bird motif sculptures, I really associate with her engagement with her, her surroundings coming out of her experience of the Second World War but also um, the more general concerns about the, the, about the um, emergence of the Cold War, actually. And I think um, I, see, I see Frink as an artist who very much is, is looking at the world around her and is fe feeling the concerns um, of humanity, and I think this comes through very strongly in her work. So this, this, um, this period very much, for me, about, about, about the Cold War predicament and then the later 50s, um, um, the Birdman, Falling Man, Spinning Man sculptures um, begin to um, sense this interest, I would say, in the, um, in, in, in the space race, actually. And actually, that many of these um, falling men, spinning men, um, are helmeted, um, they look like cosmonauts, um, I think are important um, and I believe iconic. It's never quite certain whether these, these sort of heroic figures are um, actually... Um, um, sort of running towards something or running away from something. Um, and then the, um, the great Riachi warriors um, from, um, from the late 1980s. So that's where I am with trying to sort of break her work down into, um, in, 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 into themes. Um, another element that I'm interested in, in, in working on is some outdoor pieces and these fantastic um, uh, Mirage birds from the, from the mid-1960s. Um, will feature outside of the St. Centre building. Um, some of you may be aware that we're developing the, the campus there as a sculpture park, so an element of this is to, um, is to have pieces outside as well as inside the, um, the exhibition. So I'm just going to run through some of the, um, well, some images from some of the themes that I developed. And um, these to me are uh, just, just in astonishingly uh, moving pieces, incredibly menacing um, and troubling. And um, I think um, of, the, of, of this period, um, I really can't think of any other works that address um, you know, the, con the, con the concerns of um, many people, of um, the troubles of the world. And she seems to encapsulate that within, within these pieces. And then obviously the, the polar opposites. Actually, so we've got one more shot. This is from Hauser and Worth. Um, display in 2016, which is a rather nice um, arrangement. This is Liz working on one of the. So going back to the earlier period, um, these will be familiar to many of you um, from 52 and then the later 1958 and. Um, And the Birdman from 1959, which um, we've had on display at the Sainsbury Centre for about four, four, four years now. And um, wonderful piece. This is her in, um, in Chelsea at the Park Road, the Park Walk studio. And the works that I associate with the Birdman, the Spinning Man and the Falling Man.
Okay, to try and remind people of the, um, the station in New York and um, it looks like an astonishing group of, group of pieces but um, I think something that Annette picked up on um, in her words earlier that I think um, the sort of international perspective on Frink I think is an interesting one and um, to remind ourselves that um, although she's, you know, she, she's shown, shown predominantly in, in this country um, from a very early, early moment, exhibitions were happening um, in continental Europe and also here in the United States and indeed in, in places like Canada as well. This picture I think we actually saw earlier um, from Annette slides um, is something I'm still trying to, trying to work out. And this group of, this group of Riachi figures which um, many of you know, I'm sure, that were um, inspired by this archaeological discovery um, in the early 1970s of the coast of Italy, where these um, astonishing Greek sculptures uh, were pulled from the ocean, and it was a major news story um, at the time. And, um, I mean, they, they we believe, um, represent um, um, perhaps mercenaries, um, certainly fighting men, and the sort of image of this almost like su superhuman. They really are quite incredible things. And um, I think um, what particularly impresses me is when an artist revisits something from, from the past and is able to bring something new to it and something that when you're dealing with something like this of such, such great quality, um, they're able to say something new but, it, but retain some of the spirit of the original work. And in Frink's Riachi figures, you do get this incredible sense of kind of menace and, and energy and strength. So um, she's picked up um, and has taken from, from, from the Greek bronzes, but actually reinvented it. And I, I find them an incredible as a group, but individually they are, they are wonderful. So um, and I think the, the fact, something I'm still thinking through is, is, is really to, to, to introduce... Um, a number of other artists to, to our exhibition, an artist that Frink looked at, an artist that I think um, relate well to her. Um, so, um, I mean, she talked a lot about, about the influence of Rodin. Um, she'd only seen his work in reproduction until she first went to Paris in 1951, um, where she saw sculpture uh, for the first time. Um, Germaine Richier, a very, very important figure, and if you don't know her work, I would really recommend that you look at her work, she has been rather neglected in recent, recent years. Um, but Frink met her. Um, she had a major exhibition in London in 1955, um, and Frink met her at that exhibition. And, um, and the two of them got on incredibly well. And, um, and I, I suspect they were kind of feeding off each other, actually. And then the towering fi figure of Alberto Giacometti, which I think, um, I think the influence there is very much about the, um, the approach to the actual making and the use, perhaps, of plaster. Um, Giacometti was such, a, such an important figure for any sculptor of that period. But he really occupied a very internalised sort of philosophical engagement with art, which I, which I think was less interesting to, to, to Frink. But I think his, his approach to making um, really did interest uh, as a visiting tutor. Um, she talks, talks about... Um, in various um, in interviews and um, remembers fondly. So, um, so I think those two are important in her formative years. And then um, I've just listed a number of artists that I'll, I'll probably show. Um, the Italian artist Marini, um, certainly someone like him who was interested in, in, in the horse, for example, horse motif would be someone I wanted to show. Um, Anthony Caro, before his, his great leap towards abstraction, um, was, a, was a very successful figurative artist and some of his early work um, I, would, I would want to include. And um, um, Palozzi, um, Frank talks about um, as well, and Francis Bacon, um, who she knew very well. And um, they actually they came from quite similar backgrounds, um, which is quite interesting. Um, both um, had um, fathers who were in the army and um, grew up in sort of country country estate um, or country house type setting so I think um, um, they, they had a lot in common but actually I think um, um, we shouldn't un um, underestimate the influence of a painter um, on a sculptor and I think Bacon is, is a very interesting person to, to consider 
And then um, of the 1950, um, 1950s, Lynn Chadwick, she talks about a lot. So, um, so I think um, um, he will be included as well. Um, I wanted to pick up um, here just on perhaps what uh, Kip has already saying, something very modern. And it's a theme that we often develop at the Sainsbury Centre because we have this great span in terms of um, the sculptures that we have. So, um, so clearly that's going to be um, um, a major part of our show. And um, I think with Frink's work, um, it, um, it, does, it does lend itself to be seen in the context of, of earlier works, but also within her contemporaries. And possibly with, with some contemporary practitioners. I'm looking at a number of contemporary practitioners, which I'm not going to reveal, reveal today, but um, there may well be some contemporary artists included as well. I think that's pretty much um, covered what I was going to talk about, but I'm happy to answer any questions. And um, some of these themes may develop um, during the day, but I'm really interested to hear other speakers and other, uh, other people's views on Frink's work and if some of the, the themes that I'm developing, if they sort of resonate or whether I've sort of missed something and someone suddenly points out a sculpture or a body of work that perhaps I'm overlooking. So um, thank you. One of the big themes running through a lot of um, Liz's work was her the horses and the interaction of the riders and the horses. Mm -hmm. and you didn't mention that as one of the themes that you might be going to consider in your exhibition. Um, it will be included. At the moment, it's not so sort of an individual theme. But um, I... Um, um, yeah, it's sort of going through a process of transition. I was going to include... Um, I wanted to include um, a version of um, the Dover Street horse and rider that many of you will know in, in London, just on the edge of, uh, of Piccadilly. But um, at, the, at the moment, I'm thinking of including um, a 1969 horse and rider, which is rather more expressive, actually. And um, in, the, in the themes that I've discussed, I'm, I'm not entirely sure where the horse and rider will, will sit yet, but it will definitely be, be, a, be a motif. Um, whether... Um, yeah, I think the relationship between animal and, and human is an interesting one. And I think um, clearly that's something that interests Liz. And it may be that becomes, becomes another theme so that actually um, we look at various, you know, whether it's horses or whether it's, whether it's hounds and dogs um, and how she engages with them um, or whether it's, um, um, yeah, the horse and rider as, as, as a theme. I haven't quite worked out, but it will be, it will be it's being thought about. Because yeah, certainly the sorts of forms that the riders took, some mm. of them are more like the tortured um, human figures that you showed, and some of the more shrouded, hooded ones that are, again, like some of the human figures. So you can see the crossover there. Yes, yes. And the 1969 horse and rider that, that I'm referring to, sorry, I haven't got a slide of it, um, but um, the, um, it, it, it does in many ways relate more closely to some of Marini's mm. horse and riders. And um, it's... Um, the connection between horse and rider is really, really fascinating, and it's almost as if they are kind of part of the same um, construct, actually. Um, and it's no sort of separation, and I think that's, that's kind of interesting, the dy dynamism between horse and rider, which perhaps the later one that's in Dover Street um, doesn't quite pull off. Um, and Calvin, just to think about um, other aspects of her work, um, it's probably a bit of a... Um, a controversial one, but um, the portrait that she made for um, a more commercial aspect, I mean, all artists have to put bread into their mouths and they sometimes have to do work that they may not particularly want to do. Um, and my understanding is that she made a number, not many, maybe 20, 25 portraits in her life. Um, I've got something to show you in my lecture later on, but um, I wondered if you were in any way going to consider some of those. Um, well, we have we actually have have one at the Sainsbury Centre of um, a bust portrait bust of Lord Zuckerman, um, which um, uh, will be in the exhibition. Um, I think um, I mean what I didn't touch on in my in my talk was that um, and perhaps Kip did actually. I mean she's an incredibly hard working artist, and um, you know produced an astonishing number of works. 
um, over um, a relatively short working life, and that's a kind of remarkable um, achievement. Um, is there something about her public commissions where she perhaps has to compromise some of her uh, sort of true expressive feelings? Um, possibly. I think some of the public commissions perhaps I don't find as, as successful as the works that she was clearly just doing for herself. Um, having said that, um, every time I come across a public commission, I, I still really enjoy elements of it. Um, but there's a, there is a compromise, I think, and um, I think she was particularly good at working with clients. And I think um, um, I would say the religious commissions that she undertook um, are probably the most successful, actually, of all the public commissions where I think maybe because of her background as a Catholic and her engagement with faith in some way really helped her um, to express um, real emotion. So, um, so I think the religious commissions, are, for me, are incredibly successful. Um, the portrait commissions, are, they're tricky things, aren't they? Um, someone sitting in front of you who you've got to please and probably got to flatter. Um, and... Um, I was recently in the studio of Maggie Hambling, who was doing a portrait um, sketch of, of somebody. And um, she was telling me how she really didn't like having the person sitting. Um, and she actually produced the most amazing sketch um, that um, she wouldn't let me photograph because she wanted to destroy it. Um, she said it wasn't good enough. Um, but um, I think, yeah, when you've got the weight of a commission, I think it just changes it. So um, I think the, I mean, the exhibition that happened in Nottingham a few years ago looked very closely at the public commissions. And I think for me, that's kind of been done. And with the exhibition that I'm planning, um, it's really going to be about what I feel, you know, perhaps is her strongest work and the work maybe that she felt was her strongest work. Um, so um, has that answered your question? OK, thank you. Calvin, um, something has always boiled away in the back of my mind. Is it working? Um, and that is that the men are not portraits. They are men. Mm -hmm. They're about manness. Mm -hmm. And the horses are not <coughs> portraits of a horse. They're about hoarseness. And the birds about birdness. And I think, it, you know, looking at the... Uh, commissions. It's the collision between um, appearance and sense that kind of, but I think in terms of what you're about to show, I think that that kind of inside out approach to the subject is really essential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think you said it earlier, you said that, you know, it's, 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 it's a universal man or humanity that actually she's interested in. And I think it, when it's if it has to be a portrait of somebody, then I think there's perhaps it loses slightly that 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 connection, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Calvin. Okay. Um, we break for lunch now. Uh, the next session will start promptly at quarter to two. So that's. Um,